Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. and President of City Club, welcome to our program. Today it's on the subject of health care and patients' rights. Our special guest today is the President of the American Medical Association, Dr. Thomas Reardon. New member today is Patricia Rupert, an acupuncturist at the West Side Center for Natural Medicine. Patricia, where are you? Over there. Good. Thank you. <laughs> On Friday, June the 2nd, join us for our annual meeting and election of officers and a special program featuring Govern the governor of Washington State, Gary Locke. Governor Locke will be talking about his vision for education. Governor Kitzhaber will introduce him. Because of the business meeting, the program will begin at 12 o'clock and the doors will be open at 11.15. <clears throat> Please arrive early. Please note that there's a coupon in this week's bulletin asking for volunteers to work on the, the club's ballot measure studies for the fall ballot. This is a wonderful way to get, get involved in the club, to meet people, to make lasting friendships, and also uh, understand a little bit about the ballot measures. I encourage you to complete the form or fax it and send it to the club office. Our member host today is Nikki Lynch, member of the Board of Governors and a financial consultant with Merrill, Merrill Lynch. She will ask the first question. Following Nikki's question, we will have a second question from Deborah McKay of the Health Issues Committee. After that, it's open f uh, from the floor. If you have a, qu a question, please come to the microphone, or if you'd like to put it in writing, uh, raise your hand and a staff member will bring it up to the front. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate I underwriting from Portland General Electric, Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, and Weyerhaeuser Company Foundation. <coughs> We're very grateful for their support. In a nation that sustained the longest period of economic growth in history, we have, we have to face some interesting facts. Nationwide, the number, of health, uh, the, the number with, health, the, with no health coverage has increased from 14 to 16 percent in the last nine years. That's an increase from 35 to 44 million. In Oregon, the percentage has gone from 18% to 11% uh, in large part because of the Oregon Health Plan. The controversy over the right to die has taken its toll in energy and polarization of our citizens. The cost of health coverage is shifting from the employer to the employee. The cost of drugs and thus the cost of health care is rising at a rate higher than inflation. Alternative medicine is getting serious consideration. Health maintenance organizations are a fall guy for insensitive or poor health care. Doctors are complaining about the loss of real income for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the cost of malpractice insurance. And the litany goes on. At the center of many of these issues is the American Medical Association and the doctors that it represents. Tom Reardon is president of the association. He served on the board of trustees for 10 years and has been in practice in medicine for over 40. In Oregon, he served as president of both the Multnomah and Oregon Medical Societies. At the national level, his role on a number of committees addressing health care and its quality has been substantial. He's a native of Colorado and a graduate from the Colorado School of Medicine. He came to Oregon with the U.S. Air Force in the early 60s. 
On the personal side, he's been active in the Rose Society and the Rose Festival Association and has a wholesale nursery business. That sounds like a pretty active life for a man from Boring. <laughs> Dr. Tom Reardon. Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you can imagine, when I'm introduced around the country coming from Boring, Oregon, it does get some, uh, some laughs, but I assure everybody that we try and keep it that way. Uh, because for those of you from Oregon, you know that Boring hasn't changed, at least in the last 40 years, uh, maybe with some few minor changes. Uh, but it really is an honor for me to be here this afternoon and represent the American Medical Association and speak before the uh, City Club. Uh, wherever I travel, you must know that people ask me about Oregon, they ask me about Portland, uh, they want to know about the city, they want to know about the people and the life here, and I tell them it's wonderful. And I'm probably not the Chamber of Commerce's best representative, because I, I tell them how wonderful it is, and those two or three days it doesn't rain, it's spectacular. Um, but I think it is a marvelous environment, and of course uh, we all appreciate it and we have the benefits of living here. I, I came to Portland, as, as Mr. Anderson said, in 1960 with the Air Force, and defended Portland from attack for three years. And uh, I, I, I fell in love with the country, and of course the rest is history. I found a place to practice, and, and my life has been an Oregonian. You know, I, uh, in looking back over the City Club activities in January, I, I know you heard from uh, Mayor Katz, and sometime this year from uh, the Governor, Governor Kitzhaber, and they spoke of uh, some of their plans for making the city and the state a better place to live, a better environment. Uh, they talked about uh, some numerous programs that they would like to embark upon to improve the quality of life. But I think what struck me as I uh, looked at what they talked about was an unspoken assumption uh, by both of them. And that unspoken assumption was that each of us will be healthy and active and have a good quality of life. And I think sometimes we take that for granted rather than understanding uh, what has happened in this healthcare system over the last hundred years. And I, I will talk a little bit about that today. Because good health, an active life, and a good quality of life just doesn't happen. Sometimes we are born with good genes, but I think many of you in this room will think back on what the healthcare system has done for you and, and the, uh, your ability to enjoy a good quality of life right, life right now uh, really depends on that healthcare system. And that leads me to what I would like to talk to you this afternoon, which is what the American Medical Association is doing to improve the health of the public, the health of this nation, to maintain and, maintain and improve the quality of life that we have, and what the healthcare system has done to increase the longevity and improve the quality of life over the past century. And of course, I think we'll look as we talk about this to the future also. But first, let me start with a new venture for the American Medical Association, which we started this last uh, December. And that was a venture into presidential politics, which is something we had never done before. And we did this in a rather audacious manner. We had the audacity to write all of the candidates running for the President of the United States and, and say to them, we don't think that any candidate should be elected or can be elected unless they support the health care issues which are important to the American people or the patients of this country. Now in that letter, we asked them six questions which revolved around three issues. And those three issues were, Mr. and Mrs. Candidate, if elected, would you sign into law a strong patient bill of rights which will protect the patients in this country? Mr. and Mrs. Candidate, do you, uh, will you work for and do you believe in health care coverage for all Americans and will you work to find a solution so every American has coverage for health care? And finally, Mr. and Mrs. Candidate, do you have a program or an idea of how to reform Medicare to make it a stable program for our children and our grandchildren? Now, those are all pretty big issues, but we think they're, those are national issues and they need to be addressed. Our goals for this uh, were to bring these issues to the candidates the, who are running, force them to deal with these issues and to respond on them and to let the American public know where they stood on these issues. And of course, we wanted to bring the issues to the, to the media because we wanted to keep it very visible and very high profile and, and force the candidates as they, as they campaign to talk about it. And finally, we wanted to bring these issues to the public so we could educate the public so the public knows what's happening, where the candidates stand, and there'll be a, an informed electorate when they vote for the next president of the United States this fall. Now, I think it's all you should also understand that we do not endorse any candidates. We were simply bringing the issues forward. We let, we let it be known where we stand on these issues as the American Medical Association, but we wanted the candidates to answer those questions and let the electorate, let the people know where they stood. First, of course, and foremost, has been an issue which we've been advocating for for some four or five years, and that's the Patient Bill of Rights. And I think up front I should point out to you that as I go through this, you will find that the Patient Bill of Rights is for patients. 
And there were four primary issues, uh, among others, that uh, I think have been contentious on this. And the, those, I'll go through those for you. The first is medical necessity and who should determine medical necessity. We feel that physicians should determine that medical necessity, not health plan bureaucrats. In other words, physicians should be determining what's, better, what's best for your health care and what's best treatment for you. Uh, we think that it should cover all Americans. You know, the Senate bill only covered 60 million Americans. The House bill covers all 160 million Americans in managed care, and we think it's important that it cover all Americans. We think there should be an appeals process so that if a health plan does get into the medical decision making and determination of medical necessity, that there's an appeals process which is independent, external, and binding. And those are three important words. Independent of the ex health plan, external of the health plan, and binding on the health plan. And finally, that health plans should be accountable if they make decisions which result in negligence or harm to patients. In other words, plans should be able to sue HMOs. Very briefly, I'll tell you that the, they, are, they are protected by the ERISA Act, which was passed in 1974, which is a pension act. But in 1974, we had largely a fee-for-service fee for system, fee for system of health care, and the worst thing that could happen to you as a patient is the insurance company might refuse to pay. I could provide the care, you would get the care, and then they would refuse to pay. And in that law, it says that the patient can sue to recover the cost of the service that they refuse to pay for. Now, if you fast forward to 1999, we have largely a managed care system, and the worst thing that can happen to you is they can deny the care. Yet the law only allows you to sue for the cost of that care. So if they make a decision which results in egregious harm to you, the only thing you can sue to recover is the cost of that care. Now, on the other hand, if the health plans make a decision that, that says you can't have that care, and uh, you can still sue me, the physician, if something happens to you. So we think that uh, this is the 19th, end of the 20th century, going into the 21st century, that we should come into the 21st century and accountability should be where it should be. And that's on the individual or the organization making the decision that results in harm to you. Now, the Senate passed a very weak watered down bill. It protected insurance companies and we think put money before patients and profits before patients. But the House bill, the Norwood Dingle bill, is a very strong bill of rights, which does pass the four protections I've talked to you about. And uh, we think it's very important that the House version of this bill be passed. We are now, there's an now joint conference between the House and the Senate to iron out some differences. And we hope that this will be back uh, before, for a vote before the recess. Uh, let me give you the message that I have spread across this country in many venues. I've talked to members of Congress. I've spoken to many Rotary Clubs, uh, health-related uh, health, uh, uh, organizations. And the message is this. If Congress does not pass a strong Bill of Rights before adjournment in the year 2000, we will make this an election issue this fall. We will not stop until they pass a Bill of Rights. We've worked for this for four or five years. We intend to continue it until it's passed. And uh, that's a very strong message. It has frustrated some of the leadership in Congress, but uh, they're on notice. This issue is resonating well with the public. Everywhere I go, people ask me about this. I got off an airplane in Munich, Germany, six months ago, going to the World Health Meeting, World Medical Association Meeting, I should say, and a lady pushed up four or five rows back as I was getting my bag down from the overhead rack, and she said, you've been involved with the Patient Bill of Rights. I said, yes, I have. She said, I want to thank you and I want to thank the AMA for what you're doing. It happened this last trip, this just a month ago when I went to France to another world medical meeting. Uh, my seatmates wanted to talk about the Bill of Rights and, and managed care. So it's a very, very uh, pertinent issue right now. Let me put it another way to you. This is not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's a patient issue. It's a nonpartisan issue and that is the theme we have been repeating in Washington uh, for the last uh, several months and last several years. Healthcare coverage for all Americans is an issue which we've talked about for years. We now have 40 to 45 million uninsured. If you look at the demographics of the uninsured, in any two year period, some 70 to 80 million Americans are without insurance at some point in time. They come in and out of eligibility because they're employed, they're unemployed, they're eligible for Medicaid, they're uneligible for Medicaid. There are probably only four or five million that are out of insurance continuously for two years, but that's still a significant number. Now, 80% of the uninsured work but they work at jobs that do, not, that do not allow that they have the, the necessary resources to buy health insurance. These are hardworking, honest, good Americans who are trying hard to do well, but they do not have the resources to afford health insurance, and we need to do something about it. We in the, back, in the past, we have provided health care to these people through what we call the cost shift or, or charity care. But now, because of managed care and the pressures on cost in the system, it's becoming increasingly more difficult for the physicians and the hospitals in this country to provide charity care. 
Dr. Paul Ginsburg, an economist who has a rather large Robert Wood Johnson grant, had a press conference about a year and a half ago, which I participated in. And Paul is, is longitudinally following 15 cities in this country to see what's happening in the health care and, and the changes. And he suddenly realized that in those cities or those areas where there's a high penetration of managed care, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to provide the charity care. The resources just aren't there. And the employers have oftentimes said, we want to cover and we want to pay for what our employees use but we don't want to pay for anything else. And that's getting the crunches coming, so we are, we are going to have to deal with the uninsured. In the fall of 1999, the American Medical Association put on a health sector assembly in Utah, and we invited some 60 to 65 what I call disparate groups. We had managed care, we had health insurance, uh, we had the Catholic Hospital and Health Association, we had the National Medical Association, we had ma many patient advocacy groups, and we purposely set that conference up so there were only four of us from the AMA, and we were there to sort of guide that conference and listen. We were not looking for answers or solutions. What we were looking for is di did that group feel that this is the time that we could, should look at this and was there, was there a will or a commitment to deal with the uninsured? And I can say uh, very, very truthfully to you that uh, came, what came out of that conference is yes, the time has come that we need to deal with this issue and there's a will and a commitment. Now, the reason I stress this is that the American way is to decide you're going to do something. Make a will, make a commitment. When we wanted to put a man on the moon, we found a way to put a man on the moon. If we want to solve the health care uninsured issue and health care coverage for all Americans, we will find a way to do that. Uh, let me share with you four quick principles that came out of that meeting because I think they're important. The first principle is this, that health care coverage is an investment in the infrastructure of our country, its people, and we should look at it as an investment, not necessarily a cost or an expenditure. Secondly, that we should define a basic benefit package that all Americans should have. Now, by defining a basic benefit package, we are explicitly saying we have a two- or three-tier system. We have a two- or three-tier system now. We just don't want to talk about it. It's an implicit, con implicit issue. So we say explicitly we should define what every American should have to maintain a good quality and good health. We do not want to disturb the 85% that have coverage. We want to build on that and build up into the 90s, the 95, 96, 97. Realistically, there's always going to be some people slip through, and we will probably never reach 100%, but if we could reach into the high 90s, we think that would be a real win. And finally, unfortunately, there's not a single solution that this is a multifaceted problem, and there are probably multiple ways we can deal with this. We will hold another conference uh, uh, this fall, uh, I'm, uh, yes, in September, October. I just had a call yesterday uh, uh, from Ron Pollack, Families USA, to talk about a Robert Wood Johnson grant to put on programs across the country in eight cities. And uh, I just had another call from Chip Kahn, who's the exec for Health Insurance Association of America, who is also involved in this. So there is momentum is beginning to build in other organizations. The only way we will solve this is to keep the pressure on the policymakers and the politicians in this country to deal with it. And it's going to take concerted effort by many organizations. And we intend to, to maintain a leadership role. Medicare reform, I won't say too much. We want Medicare reform to make it a stable program for our children and our grandchildren. Quite frankly, we are going to double the number of Medicare beneficiaries between the year 2010 and 2025 when the baby boomers come into the system. And if you think we have problems with funding Medicare now, we will have monumental problems by the year 2025. We really need to look at that. Technology is going to continue to give us more and better tools, do more and better things for everyone. I was in Florida recently, and in a few moments I'll come back to the technology issue, but we're better than in Florida with all the seniors to, to point out to them what a wonderful life they have, and large part because of good health care uh, and their longevity and the quality of their life. Uh, let me just parenthetically talk about pharmaceutical benefits, which has been a major issue. The American Medical Association supports the concept of pharma pharmaceutical benefits for senior citizens, but we think it ought to be done in the context of overall Medicare reform, not in isolation. If you try and do this on the budget surplus, which is here today, it may be gone tomorrow. And in five years, if there's no budget surplus and you have promised pharmaceutical benefits, you are not going to take it away. You're going to have to take that money from other programs in order to fund that. So we think it should be done in overall uh, context. Now let me share some experiences with you as I travel, particularly on the uh, uh, National House call and our venture into, uh, into presidential politics. One of the first uh, trips I took was into Des Moines, Iowa. And it was a trip more to talk to people and look at what's, the, what's going on in the healthcare system than to do politicking or campaigning. But I went to a pediatric hospital in Des Moines, and I sat down with a group of parents to talk to them about their children's health and their problems. And one parent said to me, 
our daughter requires medications that cost $5,000 a month, we have a 20% copayment. Now, I don't have to do the math for you, but that's $12,000 a year out of pocket. Now, it, that repeats itself across the country, not just in Des Moines, Iowa. Then I went to an internist's office. I uh, had an interesting experience, a very depressing experience. I met a young man who had worked for a corporation, said, I'm going to go out and set up my own business. He went off on his own, but he couldn't afford insurance uh, individually owned rather than through his employer. I met a couple, and a gentleman that's about 75, had serious heart disease. He was on multiple medications. Now, his wife in her 70s had to go back to work in order to buy the medications to maintain that, her husband. But I think the story that was so telling was a gentleman who looked at me and he said, I'm 62 years old. I lost my job to a younger man at age 59 and my health care coverage. Last month, I was diagnosed with a lung tumor. I have to make a decision whether I want to spend all my family's resources in order to buy or in order to pay for some uh, radiation or chemotherapy to buy an extra year or two of life, or whether I want to leave a home for my wife when I die. Now, he agonized, and he and his wife had many conversations with that internist, and ultimately, the decision was to forego medical treatment. Because in the present environment, you have to spend down to poverty level to be eligible for Medicaid. And his worry was his family and his wife. I've told that story many times, and I, I quite frankly always say no one in the United States of America should ever have to make that decision. But those decisions are made across this country each and every day. Portland, Oregon, Denver, Colorado, Des Moines, Iowa, it's repeated. Well, I'm going to shift gears just a moment and talk to you about what a tremendous and a good health care system we have. Uh, I feel that the medical profession and the health care system has been on the defensive for too long over the issues of cost, quality of care, medical errors. That's not to say that we can't do better. We can be more efficient. We can practice better quality medicine. We can better quality of care, and we can decrease medical errors. But I think we have a marvelous story to tell, and I'm going to share some experiences with you uh, as I go through the end of my talk. If you look back at the ninth in the last century, from 1900 to the year 2000, in 1900, physicians could do little more than sit by the bedside and watch patients die. The first major scientific breakthrough in the healthcare system was the discovery of insulin in 1920. In the 20s and 30s, along came immunizations, and we could finally prevent some disease. In the 40s and 50s came antibiotics, and lo and behold, physicians could cure something. That's only 50 years ago that we finally begin to cure something. Now with the Genome Project and genetic mapping, genetic engineering, we are on the verge of predicting and preventing disease. Preventing disease. But you know, if you think healthcare costs have been a problem up until now, look into the future. I was at the World Medical Meeting last fall when a vice president from Glaxo Welcome talked to us about the genetic mapping, genetic engineering. And she said, in the future, doctors won't just prescribe a beta blocker for a patient. They will get the genetic map to find out what beta blocker meets that patient's needs and which will work the best. That's the type of science we're looking at in the future. Uh, we are on the verge of some major breakthroughs. I think it's exciting. And I tell medical students, I think this is the greatest time in the world to go into medicine. You know, I'm on the twilight of my career, but they're just beginning. And I think what they're going to be able to do in the next 20, 30 years is going to be phenomenal. And I look at the changes that have occurred from 1960 when I went into medicine. But let's look at other uh, issues, and the technology which has improved the quality of life. Uh, uh, the, that 1950, the, the years 1950 to the years 2000, we just didn't have antibiotics. We developed CAT scans, MRIs, non-invasive technology. Uh, I can tell you in the 1960s, 50s when I interned, uh, in order to do a, 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 a angiogram of the brain, you had to inject multiple times, dye into the carotid artery, take multiple pictures. There was always morbidity. There was always damage. Now you have no invasion, uh, invasive techniques. It's non-invasive. You go in and get a CAT scan or MRI, it gives you more uh, information, and it doesn't harm you. We now have joint replacements. We now have cabbages or coronary artery bypass. We have angioplasty. We have endoscopy. All this is, con while it's contributed to the patients, it has contributed to the economy, and I will come back to that. But let me tell you a story about some of my patients in the 60s, and then I'll relate it to the present day. My elderly male patient in the 1960s with angina was oftentimes confined to home or with very limited activity. And now I send him out for a cabbage, coronary artery bypass, or angioplasty, and he's either back to work or he's out on the golf course. My elderly female patient with a worn out knee who was on a cane or a crutch, who could barely get around out of the house, maybe to the store occasionally, I now send out for joint replacement. Now they fly to Reno with their girlfriends for the weekend. 
If you, had, uh, if you had polyps in your colon in 1960, in order to get those polyps out, you would have an 8 to 12 inch incision in your abdomen. Now they go up with a little scope and they snake them out and you either drive home or go home, a friend takes you home, but you go back to work the next day. If you had cataracts in the 60s, you couldn't operate on them until they were, quote, mature and you were practically blind. And then when you were operated on, they gave you Coke bottle thickness glasses and you still couldn't see. Now they pop those lenses out, they put new ones in, they give you glasses and your vision's almost perfect. Patient with asthma. Patients with asthma at the turn of the century, that was an acute illness and patients died in days or weeks from asthma. When I went into practice in the 50s, we did better. We could control it pretty well, but now with today's technology and pharmaceuticals, asthmatics can lead almost a normal life and many times a normal life and, and normal longevity. While all this contributes and improves the quality of life, it contributes to the economy. About a month or six weeks ago, I was returning to Portland from Washington, D.C., and uh, fortunately my seatmate happened to be Senator Mark Hatfield, and uh, we had a nice visit. We always visit when we see one another. But he told me, as I talked about this, of a study he had just done, and he had commissioned some economists at the University of Chicago to evaluate what the impact of a health care line longevity has been on the economics of this country. In other words, the longevity, we've doubled the life expectancy from the year 1900 to the year 2000. It's gone up 10 years from 1960. What the improvement in the quality of life and increased pro productivity has meant to the economy of this country. And those economists have estimated that the longevity, the increased quality, the productivity contributes some two and a half trillion dollars a year to our GDP. And that's on an economy that has nine trillion. Somewhere about 25 to 30 percent can be contributed back to what the healthcare system has accomplished. And you might ask me, Dr. Reardon, how can that be so? Well, let's talk about it. That angina patient who was confined to the home or maybe could uh, just could go somewhere briefly in the evenings, now either goes back to work and is a productive citizen or he plays golf and he buys gas, he pays green fees, he buys golf balls, he buys golf clubs, he has lunch out. That lady with the worn out knee now buys an airplane ticket, she flies to Reno, she plays a hotel bill, or she flies to see her grandchildren. She buys presents. That cataract patient who had very, very poor vision without thick glasses now has perfect vision, enjoys TV, can go out to the symphony, the opera, uh, and, ha and can have a normal life, and she can travel where they might not earlier. The asthma patient is a highly productive person back in society, not at home week after week or many weeks a year being non-productive and, and a drain. And finally, the endoscopy patient who had those polyps removed through that scope and not a big abdominal incision in the hospital seven or eight days is back to work the next day. All of that has an imp impact on the healthcare system. Yes, all of that costs money, but it has increased the longevity in this country, it has increased the quality of life, and it's made vigorous and active seniors. And as I said, when I was in Jacksonville, Florida last week, what better group to talk to at the Rotary there than a group of seniors who had had all this technology and were functioning very actively and very productively. Every healthcare system in the world, though, is in trouble. I have been in five continents. I go to the World Medical Meeting each year. I talk to other countries. So regardless of how we finance health care, whether we do it with a government base, an employer base, or you do it strictly with government, every health care system in the world is in trouble with costs. Technology has given us more and better tools to do more and better things for patients, but there is a cost. And we take a lot of this for granted. With first dollar coverage in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there became a sense of entitlement in this country to health care, and it wasn't something that they had to pay for out of pocket. And I will tell you, I see a shift happening in this country right now in the financing of health care, and that's to a defined contribution. Corporate America is drawing a line in the sand saying, we can't afford these increased health care costs. We are in a, a world economy, world competition, and we are going to pay so much. And Mr. and Mrs. Employee, you tell us where you want the contribution to go and what you want. If you want an HMO or a PPO or a PO point of service or whatever you want. Now, you may have to dig into your pocket and pay a difference on the premium. You have, may have to pay greater copayments or greater deductibles, but that is going to continue to be the trend in this country for the near future and into the far, I think, into the far future. Technology is going, as I say, to give us more and better tools, to more and better things. As I talked about the Genome Project, genetic engineering, uh, there are a wide variety of technology coming on board. This is not to say that we in the system can't be more efficient. We can be. We can be more cost effective. This is not to say we can't improve quality of care. We are working to improve quality of care. And it doesn't mean that we can't incre decrease the number of errors in the system and make this a, a safer healthcare system. We can and we will do that. 
But I, I think you need to understand that the, that the healthcare system and all the technology which we take for granted today, much of it wasn't here 50 or 60 years ago. But what it has done is it extended our life expectancy into the almost 80, and it will. Every four years, life expectancy goes up a year, and I think that will continue. Uh, I guess in closing, I would just say, while this has extended our quality of life, extended the, the longevity of life, and made us a happier, uh, a, a better population, it also costs money, and it's going to continue to cost, and health care costs are going to go up. At some point in time in this country, we have to have a conversation, a broad-based conversation with citizens, with ethicists, with clergy, with politicians, with physicians, uh, everybody in the healthcare professions. How much is enough and how much are we willing to pay for? Because ultimately that's what's going to come down to. The uh, crisis we've had on healthcare costs and then the, uh, the crunch through the managed care. Managed care has done some good things. Managed care has sensitized us to all the cost. Uh, it has resulted in, in uh, medical management, it has resulted in guidelines, protocols, which I think has improved, helped improve care. But it has probably <laughs> wrung as much out of the system as it can, and suddenly you're going to see that curve go back up. Part of this is patient demand, and part of it is the high technology, which is going to improve, improve the quality of life and improve the longevity that we all have. I really thank you for the opportunity to be here and share these thoughts with you today. And I uh, heard Mr. Lloyd say uh, there will be some questions and answers. I look forward to that. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and perhaps I'm sort of restating what you were saying at the end, but it seems to me the way I view it is that there's sort of a collision course of, you know, we were so uh, worried about health care costs and the big demand and that sort of brought on the HMOs and the success of the HMOs. And now we're sort of turning around and, and demanding that, you know, that there can't be constraints put. It seems to me that we're on a collision course with costs and, you know, where, you know, where do you think that extra money is going to come from? I mean, how much more can come out of doctor's hides or hospital hides or insurance hides or is it going to come out of our pockets as premiums or taxpayers or whatever? Good question. Uh, it's going to come out of probably the, uh, the patients. Uh, some of it will come, I think, out of corporate America. I think employers will continue to up their contributions a little. But I really think that there's going to be a shift to the patient, to the individual, of increasing sharing of premium, uh, increased copayments and deductibles. I think we're going to re-engage the demand side of the equation so that when patients demand something, they feel the impact of their demands. It's very easy to come into a physician's office and say, you know, I've been having headaches, I've had this, I'd like to have a CAT scan and an MRI, without ever realizing that's $400, $800. Now, the, the fine line that I think we face here is that while I'm a firm believer that everybody should pay something every time they impact the health they access the healthcare system, we don't want that to be such an impediment that people would not seek health care. That's the fine line. But I think that corporate America, while they will contribute, continue to increase some, are going to uh, draw a line and say we can't continue to pay these premiums. Um, I think I'll leave it at that, but I think every healthcare system in the world is going to have to face this in some way. Hi, Dr. Reardon. I'm Deborah McKay. I'm on the uh, Healthcare Issues Committee. I'm also a pre med student at Portland State University. Thanks for an interesting speech, and thank you very much for all your public service with the American Medical Association. Um, my question today is regarding medical education. What needs to change in the way that we select and train the next generation of healthcare providers? Specifically, how can we address the underrepresentation of minorities as healthcare professionals? And what about the traditional rivalry between allopathic and all the other disciplines in healthcare? Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right. Okay, let me start out. Good question, and I think very timely, uh, Deborah. And I, congratulations on being a pre-med student. I think I think you've made the greatest choice in the world. I uh, am always distressed to, when I hear physicians say, "Well, I wouldn't advise my son or daughter to go into medicine." I think it's great. I think you've made a great choice, and I wish you all successes. Uh, medical education. Um, uh, there's going to have to uh, be some support of medical education. I think I'm going to make a comment, which uh, may come back to haunt me, but I'll do it anyway. Um, what I noticed in the 70s and 80s oftentimes is that unless you had practically a four-point average, three, eight, three, nine, four point, you couldn't get into medical school. And the, the product of what I saw from medical school as they came through the system, their intern residency, was that they were very bright. My goodness, they were bright. But their humanistic skills were not that good. 
and that I don't think you have to have all the four-point students in medicine. I think you have to be a good student. Um, I looked at my medical school class, and I looked at the eight or ten at the top, and the ones in the middle and the bottom, and I thought those were great students and great people, and they will probably do well, but you know, one became a dean of a medical student uh, school, one became a, a couple went into research, but it was those people in the middle who really were good uh, students, average students, but they had good humanistic skills, and I think that relationship is what we have to talk about. Uh, m minorities is another issue. We need to make an uh, a attempt to, to get more minorities into school. I'm always a little concerned that when I see, uh, if you accept minorities in a medical school who can't get through medical school, you're not doing them a favor, nor are you doing the system a, a, a service. So I think academically, uh, they have to be able to prove that they can get through. Uh, the limited licensed practitioners or the conflicts in medicine, I think we need to recognize that limited licensed practitioners have a place in the system. And that we need to get away from these turf battles and arguing about money and say, uh, look, we all contribute to the care of the people in this country, uh, and it should be done on their education, their competencies, and their skill level. And that should be how we say their, their scope of practice should be. It should be on their education, their competencies, and their skill level. Um, and I, th I think if we do that, I think it can be a win-win for all. The interesting thing about this, the patients in this country are demanding access to the limited licensed practitioners and allied health practitioners. Uh, actually, the people in this country pay about 30 to $35 billion out of pocket to go to limited licensed practitioners, and that's more money than spent on all primary care in the traditional healthcare system. Now, there's a message there, and you have to ask, why are they paying that out of pocket and going to these other practitioners? Well, uh, the message I keep giving the physicians is because they listen, they pay attention, they're interested, and they have good humanistic skills. We cannot hide behind technology and science. We've got to listen to people and communicate. Um, my name is Sharon Joy, City Club member. There's no issue that is more important to me and my friends that I've lived with for many years than the right to die. Uh, just to be free of fear, not that we're going to take it up, anybody up on it, but just to have that right. Uh, to me, that's patients' bill of rights more than anything else. And we cannot go to Congress to ask for it. But the Multiple Sclerosis Society is in favor of it and is trying to champion us. Um, to me, um, everyone born will die, and that means perfect balance is nature's ideal. And longevity does not necessarily attach to quality of life. Uh, I have seen so many personally uh, where they have shown me the hospital bills for five days of miserable life. Or, uh, for instance, a lady of 80 who had a car accident could, had put in her file not to extend her life. So my question is, if the doctors are not willing to help us in this regard, um, um, can they at least not stand in the way of us having this right? Uh, that's a good question, and while I didn't ad address it in my, uh, my formal remarks, let me talk about our, the American Medical Association's position on the, uh, the uh, uh, right to die uh, bill in Oregon. You know, we have opposed uh, assisted suicide in Oregon on ethical grounds uh, in the context that our role as physicians are healers and that we should not take lives. Now, you raise some interesting issues. And I, and I think, uh, you know, we oppose the Nichols-Hyde bill, which is before Congress now two years ago. We have supported it more recently because we think we got the necessary language changes, which actually protects physicians in their care. And I think the issue, I chaired a task force with the AMA some three or four years ago to oppose assisted suicide. Broad-based task force. We had uh, multiple representatives, nurses and all kinds, you know, across the board. It just wasn't doctors. And one of the questions that we begin to talk about is why is the public interested in this, in the right to die and assisted suicide? And the, what the conclusion we came to was that we in the profession aren't doing enough good in taking, aren't doing, a, aren't doing a good job of taking care of them at the end of life. And that, so therefore, we changed our task force to uh, quality of care at the end of life to talk about the aggressive use of pain medication, uh, management of emotional issues, and if, uh, if there were uh, uh, spiritual issues to make provision so that they could have those. 
Uh, we think the Nichols Hyde bill does help us along that line. Um, you've also brought up another issue, which I think is very important, that's futile care. And I think sometimes doctors do not know when to stop treating and that we need to turn to comfort care and make the patient as, comfort as comfortable as possible as they go through those last days or weeks and they're, and they're dying. Uh, Father Michael Place from the Catholic uh, Health Association uh, I met with um, three or four or five months ago. That was one of the issues. And we intend to begin to address that issue of uh, the amount of money or th that's spent on futile care. It's not only the amount of money, it's the patient, the impact on the patients when you prolong that dying process by days or weeks when it's unnecessary. We all know at times that we've lost the battle and that the end is inevitable and that we should turn to comfort care and keep the patient as comfortable as possible as they go through that. And that's pretty much where we are now. Pardon? Yeah. Then well, we, I, and as I say, we've opposed that on the ethical grounds, and uh, we've supported the Nichols Hyde bill for the reasons I've given you. I'm going to rotate between uh, the floor and written questions up here. The, the next written question is, as stated in opening remarks, doctors are complaining about the loss of real income in recent years. Can you elaborate on how a patient's bill of rights will benefit physicians economically? Actually, the patient bill of rights will not benefit the, the, the physicians economically in any great manner. What it really does, uh, uh, two things. It does give decision making on medical necessity back to physicians, where we think it should be, where, which I always had when I was in practice, um, and also on the external appeals. But basically, the patient's bill of rights is for patients. Uh, and I, it is one of those issues which, uh, in our advocacy this year, I think uh, the AMA's image is higher than it's ever been in the public because of issues like this. And we intend to continue advocating for patients. So I don't see the Patients' Bill of Rights as something that will, in, will uh, impact physicians economically or uh, their incomes. Heather Kinnett, City Club member. Um, first, Doctor, I hope that the gentleman who was trying to decide between a home for his wife and health care was given the option of seeking an elder law attorney who could have allowed him to have both. Uh, uh, seeking a what? An elder law attorney. Uh, I don't know that he did. It would have I been a nice know. recommendation, one you might keep in mind in the future, so that someone doesn't have to choose between life and death in a situation like that. My question is this. A lot of your discussion has been focused on who is going to pay for care, how we're going to reconfigure that, that payment, and then how much. I'd like to know what you're doing in regards to reducing the need for care. Long-term care is strangling our health care system. I'd like to know what is being done with all this technology to eliminate the need for long-term care. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point and a good question. Preventive care, which we've talked about for so many years, uh, really wasn't paid for by insurance. You know, the, the health maintenance concept, uh, managed care came into being some 20 years ago with the idea of preventive care. Even managed care did not uh, cover preventive care until more recent years. But I think preventive care, everyone should have access to basic preventive care, immunizations, pap smears, mammograms, uh, you know, blood pressure, cholesterol, prostate checks, et cetera. Uh, because if you prevent disease up front, it, it's, it's much less costly. Secondly, when it comes to the uninsured, uh, the uninsured don't access the system until they're much sicker, they go into the emergency rooms, the cost of their care is much greater and the outcome is much poorer. So there's, an, there's another issue there. But the other issue, I think, is the emphasis on wellness programs. Uh, good eating, good exercise, uh, non-smoking, drinking in moderation, et cetera, I think will also lead to that. Uh, but what I'm t you know, part of what I'm talking about there has got to be disciplined by the individual. We can emphasize that. We can talk to patients. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time talking to patients about not smoking, about exercising, about losing weight. Um, but I can't force them to do it. I can't give them pills to make them do it. I can, I can encourage them. I can uh, give them ideas and et cetera. But I think wellness and preventive care are the two areas which have to be emphasized uh, to try and lower health care costs. Now, unfortunately, uh, as we get older, regardless of how healthy we are, when we're 60 or 70, we're still going to develop the infirmities of age, which is heart disease, pulmonary disease, um, uh, arthritis, or, or uh, musculoskeletal disease. Dementia. Uh, dementia. All those things cost. And uh, so I like to see people live a lot of time. You know, I've always said uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, uh, grandfather uh, was still on horseback at age 80, cutting the calves. At 85, he was chasing him on a Jeep. At 88, he was sitting out watching, and at 90, he died of a heart attack. I might write that contract. <laughs> what is the position of the AMA on long-term care for a variety of groups? 
the elderly, the physically disabled, persons with severe and persistent mental illness? Well, you know, we, we support the term of uh, the concept of long-term care. The issue is the financing of long-term care. And I'm, I can't tell you that we have any particular programs except that we recognize the cost, we recognize the problem. Uh, we support equality of, of reimbursement for uh, physical as well as mental illness and, and, and that area. And that's been a tough issue for the mental health people and that uh, uh, funding for mental health has, de has diminished in recent years because of the cost pressures. But we're very supportive of those issues. Um, I, can't, I can't cite any particular programs. Irwin Mandel, City Club member. Uh, during the course of your address, Dr. Reardon, you alluded to the need in the future for a discussion with ethicists, members of the medical profession, uh, civilians, one might say, uh, along the lines of the topic, uh, how much care is enough? Would you care to expand on that issue? Because it is one that is really cropping up everywhere. In fact, I think it cut across several of the questions you've been asked up until now. Uh, I think you're entirely right. No, I, I think what we've talked about in that line is, uh, you know, I include the pu public has to be involved in this. Uh, John Q. Citizen, uh, this just can't be a, 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 the politicians and the physicians and the ethicists and the clergy. This has to be a, I think what I'm saying is that I see that technology will continue to drive healthcare costs because technology is con continuing to develop more and better tools for me as a physician, other physicians in this audience, to do more and better things for patients. It all comes at a cost. Now, if we go back to one of the questions a moment about wellness and preventive care, that could certainly cut costs. But I see a, sort of a crisis coming. I see corporate America saying, uh, drawing a line in the sand, we can't continue to absorb these increases in healthcare costs because of a, we're in a world economy, world competition. Uh, we are going to draw a line in the sand and we're going to uh, go to de define contribution, which means they will pay so much a month and they will say to the employee, Mr. or Mrs. employee, where would you like this sent and how, what kind of care do you want? Uh, I, this may be something we put off, you know. Unfortunately, in this country, we ordinarily, we ordinarily don't deal with issues until there's a crisis. And how much further this has to go and how big the crisis has to be before we finally admit we have a problem, I don't know. Will the AMA continue to oppose national health insurance? <laughs> um, we. You know, this has come up because I, when I talk to medical groups across the country and I say, you know, we are working for health care coverage for all Americans, this question comes up and say, well, is the AMA look, working for national health care or a government-run system or single payer? And the answer is absolutely not. We think we can achieve you know, uh, health care coverage for all Americans or universal coverage, which is a little bit of a flashpoint, in the traditional way we've done it between employers and government. Now, uh, let me give an example. One of our proposals to provide health care for all Americans and the uninsured is this. If you look at the deductibility of health care premiums right now, that costs the federal treasury some 70 to 80 billion a year. If you do away with the deductibility of health care premiums and use that 70 to 80 billion for refundable tax credits for the working poor, you can cover almost all the working poor with that 70 to 80 billion. Now there's winners and losers. Those of us who have done well in life, who are making more income, will lose the deductibility of, of health insurance because when your employer pays your health insurance, it will be charged back to you as, as income and you will pay taxes on it. On the other hand, it would benefit the uninsured, the person down here with a low income who can't afford health insurance. So anything we do, there's, there's, going, to be, there's going to be problems. There's going to be a shift. I'm Dr. Ewan Horneman, a member of the Health Issues Committee of the City Club. I'm also a member of the Oregon Medical Association. The American Academy of Medicine has found that 200 Americans die every day from preventable mistakes in hospital. That's malpractice. To put it into perspective, in one year, a third more Americans die in hospitals than died in the whole of the Vietnamese War. To put it more in perspective, it's the equivalent of an airliner plunging into the ocean every day of the year. It kills more people than car accidents, guns, and alcohol, even with the aid of the more murderous students. Um, my question to you is, what is the American Medical Association doing in the way of working towards protocols which will prevent this? 
Uh, Dr. Horman, thank you. Uh, the Institute of Medicine report, which came out this past year talking about the medical errors, was based on some data developed by Lucian Leap and others at Harvard many, uh, several years ago. Uh, there's always some argument in the profession about how accurate that is, but nonetheless, there, there are a problem with medical errors in the system and preventable errors. And uh, in recognition of that, some three to four years ago, the AMA created the National Patient Safety Foundation, which is a broad-based foundation which we have spun off as an independent organization to begin to address the issue of medication errors, uh, uh, any type of error. Now, the issue is to identify the errors, discuss the errors, and then to change the system so that those errors don't take place. Um, one of the big debates we're having now is whether there should be mandatory reporting of all errors. And until there is some um, protection as there is in the airline industry for reporting of errors, you're probably not going to get medical errors reported. Now, the president supported the concept of reporting of egregious errors. And by egregious errors, I'm talking about you cut off the wrong leg, you operate on the wrong side of the brain. Just to give you an anecdote, the day I testified for Congress on this issue, on the front page of the New York Times, the headlines was, doctor operates on the wrong side of the brain for the second time. Uh, <laughs> not, when you want, not when you want on the front page of the New York Times when you're going for Congress. We support uh, very clearly the Institute of Medicine's report. Uh, we think there are clearly many things we can do. Uh, there is a system uh, that we all know about that takes care of the egregious errors, and that's a legal system. But l let's say you, there is an egregious error and there's a lawsuit. Unless there is some uh, non-discoverability of the discussions, physicians are not going to just sit down and have a broad-based discussion on that medical error as long as it's open to the plaintiff's attorney. And so we have, we have, we have uh, advocated for peer review protection and non-discoverability of those discussions so that we can feel free to sit down and have those discussions to make the changes. What we don't want to do is drive this all underground and not talk about it. So we are quite willing to work with the President, with Congress, in any way we can. We have supported uh, the ARC, which is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, to be the agency to do some research about what's the best way to identify errors, what's the best way to discuss errors, and what's the best way to institute the corrections. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has done something very simple. They recommend that the surgeon and the nurse go into the patient's bedside the, the night of before surgery in the morning up, and you write on the joint, this is it. <laughs> and uh, you know, that sounds crazy. But I can tell you, uh, and I did not do surgery, but I can remember examining patients who are on the exam table, and I examine the right knee and go over it. And then I sit down at my desk, and I look at the patient facing me, and it's very easy to put left down because of the, of the, of the change. So anything we can do, however simple, uh, we need to do. Medication errors. Uh, you full well know the insulin, potassium chloride, and another medication are commonly kept side by side in the medicine cabinet. Injection of potassium chloride will kill you. Now, why isn't that marked with skull and crossbones? Why isn't it in a separate place locked? Uh, we can go out on infinitum about why. The issue is we need to identify those and make the changes to correct them. Discuss DNA studies in Iceland. <laughs> Who, uh, who's from Iceland? Well, the issue in Iceland is, is that the parliament up there uh, decided last year to develop a national database on all Icelanders. So they're going to gather all the medical information in Iceland and put it on a data bank. And this really raised a red flag to the physicians in Iceland about privacy and confidentiality. And uh, so we've had a big discussion at the World Medical Meeting about that. Um, th this whole issue of privacy and confidentiality is going to open up soon because we are moving into the uh, electronic world in medicine where we will have paperless records and where we may use the internet to, for, for patients' information and to transfer data. And the AMA is now working with Intel to develop a physician credentialing program, which would be an encryption system, so that when you sign on or off the internet, uh, they know you are who you say you are. But uh, I think it's exciting. I think what is going to be done uh, electronically with, with patient care and patient uh, information is just phenomenal. The issue is how do we assure the privacy and confidentiality of that information? Now, when you talk about DNA in Iceland, um, it's going to be the same problem in this country. And the real concern is the misuse of that information by insurers or uh, employers. And I, I've thought this too. I've talked about it a lot. There's a wide discussion from the researchers who say we need uh, physician-specific information in order to do research, to the psychiatrists who say no information, no way, no time, 
to the quality people in the middle who say, we need patient information, but it can be uh, nonspecific. It's just in general, so we can do the quality assurance. And I kind of stand in the middle, because I'm, I'm on the board of NCQA, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, and we do need access to patient information, but it does not have to be patient specific. It's in the aggregate information about uh, what, what, what percent of patients are getting beta blockers, what percent of patients are getting immunizations, et cetera. Uh, but the issue of DNA is the mis potential misuse of that and the impact it might have on insurers or our uh, employers. Hi, I'm Susan Pierce. I'm a member and a hospice nurse. If we could go back to the Nichols Hyde Amendment and a patient, oh, Nickel Hyde. And a patient quality of care issue. Um, I want your, I'd like some comments from you on this. Currently, we in Oregon, we know that we're ahead of much of the nation in our um, concepts and recognition of uh, pain needs and symptom management. And, and uh, we are able to get liberal prescriptions from physicians, both in terms of amount of dosage and um, a range of of uh, administration and amount given. That allows patients, families to make limited trips to the pharmacy, leaving the patient behind. It allows those of us who may be on call in the middle of the night to increase the dose so the patient doesn't have to wait until 8.30 in the morning when there's a physician available to give the dose. We're, many of us in hospice are really concerned that this amendment is going to hamstring us Already we know or we sense that we're being watched very, very closely about the way we document um, patient needs and the amount given and when given and all of that's important, but um, it, it does distract us from, there's a point where it distracts us from patient care. And then on the other hand, to go to a totally different type of patient needs, even the commonly prescribed 100 count bottle of digoxin is certainly enough to kill a patient. Correct. So, could you comment? <laughs> well, um, yeah, several comments. Um, you bring up an interesting point, and, and while we were concerned initially that the Nichols Hyde Bill would have a chilling impact on, on what you do, we think the language change will benefit you. First of all, uh, they explicitly put into the language that the, uh, the recognition of the aggressive use of pain medication may hasten death. In other words, the they call it the double effect, et cetera. And we all know, as we increase these dosages, that that can uh, impact the respiratory center. The respiratory center. The issue is intent. If you're increasing that dose methodically and logically and in an in a, in a, in a appropriate way to take care of pain and suffering, there's not a problem. Uh, if you write 100 pills to be taken at once, which is going to kill somebody, there is a problem. So it's clearly the intent of how you're treating that patient. Now, the second issue is uh, the documentation. We all have to document better everything we do. Physicians have to document better. You're going to have to document better. And I'm not talking about pain management. I'm talking across the board. Documentation is not as good as it could be and should be. And I think it's going, we're going to be held accountable. Uh, we also got some changes in the law to say that the federal government does not set the standards of care, that the standards of care are set by states, where it's traditionally been by the State Board of Medical Examiners. The federal government has always had the right to oversee controlled substances. So there's nothing new. It's just that they haven't done it. And I think, as Car I, sent I had a long talk with Senator Wyden on the plane the other day, he's really concerned about Senator Nichols and some of that. And I'm, not, I'm concerned that we're getting down to some personalities here uh, rather than issues. Uh, but I, we think the language does protect you, so you'll be able to provide the care you need to give. I, I think a lot of people are still quite yeah. Well, I understand that. Do you favor price controls on pharmaceuticals which are increasing at 20 to 25 percent a year? If not, what other ways can we curb these expenditures? That's a loaded question. Uh, you know, we've always, uh, the reasons pharmaceuticals are less expensive in other countries is price controls. So patients go to Mexico, patients go to Canada. I have patients tell me they come back from Europe and they buy all kinds of things much cheaper than they do here. I think we've always been reluctant to support price controls in any segment of our economy. I mean, this is a free market in this country. Uh, I understand the problems, uh, but I'm very, we, we have not endorsed price controls. Uh, we think that we need to work with pharmaceutical houses to uh, find